Greetings. This is at Maboda. Today is February 17th, 2022. We've got a special guest today. His name is Arya, and he is from Iran and presently living in China. Welcome, Arya. Hey, hey. Glad to be here. Fantastic. Well, it's great to have you on board with us. And one reason why you were brought to my attention is we have a mutual friend who is in, heavily involved in Tai Chi and sp spirituality. And he recommended that I, I speak with you and you agreed to come on this podcast. Now, it's very brave of you and really appreciate having you on. Likewise, man. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. And uh, yeah, Silvash is a good friend. And uh, I'm curious for this chat. I'm excited. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I understand that you do some one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching and you do some maybe other classes having to do with mindfulness in China. And I was curious about how your philosophy and your beliefs are set up. And in fact, if you could you tell us a, a bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah. So I was born in uh, Iran and I grew up in California. Um, when I was eight years old, uh, my, I moved to California and, um, and uh, I don't know. Yeah. My story, I guess is a lot of uh, mental health struggles <laughs> you could say. And um, I ended up uh, getting my uh, bachelor's in cognitive science was really interested in design and human computer interaction. And um, yeah, cognitive science is a really fascinating field. It's really diverse and multidisciplined and, um, so it's the friction across different uh, ideas that, that gave birth to that field. I guess that's why I kind of uh, fell into that. And, um, and that kind of like sums up my whole like philosophy, or I guess what you want to say is like just being curious and exploring different ideas without necessarily trying to agree or disagree, but deploying empathy and putting yourself in different perspectives, you know, so, um, yeah, and then uh, after that, I went into my master's for psychology. And yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, uh, like most of my life was, about, was depression. Like most of my 20s was just a constant, like I'm deep inside this dark hole, helpless and broken and unreachable. And it sucks, you know, and especially when you don't know why. It, you come out of it, you come back down in it. And um so there's some frustrations around that. And, um, you know, through a series of mentors and therapy and meditation and um, just uh, my own creative practice, um, I kind of, uh, yeah, it kind of healed parts of myself and I'm still healing and it's an adventure, you know? And my thesis on healing is that it's a creative process. Mm. And it grows with a quiet mind. Well, and uh, definitely yeah, agree about quiet thing. mind for sure. And also, you mentioned something yeah. earlier about the now, and um, I, I am also in agreement with that. In fact, I used to own the domain name thenow.com, which I no longer own, but I do own divinity.com, which I suppose that, that's better, which is fine. But yeah, could you just share your conception of the now? Uh, conception of the now. I mean, um, or like your interpretation of what that means. There's different practices and gateways into it. Starts with the breath, the body, acceptance, that sort of thing. Acceptance is and, a beautiful word. I love that. Mm, and there's many moments that you can enter and be available to and um yeah like before you were talking about receiving and that's a huge part of all this is then i i call that listening you know and you know normally when you think about listening it's a you have an ear you do the you know you have the ear apparatus to do the listening of auditory stimulus Mm -hmm. But your body is in here, you know, your body, your brain is a organ that's, that's a system. Um, 
and a healthy system is open, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I've kind of learned to acknowledge what I feel inside of myself and observe without judgment. And um, yeah, that soft attention, observing in a stillness and the silence, you know, um, yeah. there's a uh, space there, you know, inside everybody's heart. And um, yeah. Could you share if you've had any specific experiences of, of this? Would you say, would you have anything that maybe science could not explain any experiences like that? Like esoteric experiences? Sure. Esoteric, spiritual, however you want to frame it. Um, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a <laughs> layered question, but um, I started meditating when uh, in my teens, uh, I started doing uh, Kung Fu. Mm. And uh, yeah, I, I started doing that because I was watching a lot of films with uh, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. And, you know, they were inspiring. And I thought, you know, uh, it looks really fun. So, you know, I started doing Kung Fu in my teens. And you know what? When I came to China, I thought everyone knows Kung Fu. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, kind of disappointed about that. But, um, you know, that's so luckily in that in that school of uh, martial art, um, they had uh, like meditation was a big part of that practice. So um, Qigong. Yeah. So we did a lot of that. Like, yeah, so that was a kind of part of my routine and my days and my weeks. And then uh, I did that for like four years. And uh, but the depression was still there, you know. So I continued looking, uh, you know, practice like Zen meditation. I did a uh, 10 day Vipassana retreat in the desert in California. Um, wow. Yeah. Different mindfulness uh, and, uh, you know, mindfulness based stress reduction programs and all that kind of stuff to just get more, uh, train my senses to be more present and surrender my story, surrender to the process and trust the silence, you know, um, the modern world, you know, modern life is full of uh, noise. So got to be able to cut the noise and, um, uh, just kind of drop into your senses. And, um, so, you know, there's uh, also intuition, this, you know, like kind of withdrawal intuition. from your senses. The big question that say again, like withdrawal from your senses. Or, yeah. Draw from your senses. And or, or, defined or, or, by what I'm saying is withdraw, sure. withdraw from your senses. Would you say that withdraw. would be withdraw? Hmm. what do you think uh, about that I try concept to, be attuned to my senses attuned to your senses because i think that's a kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy between the buddhism and yogic philosophy because whereas in yoga they tend to teach more about withdrawing from your senses whereas in maybe vipassana it's not about withdrawing from your senses but maybe even about observing observing everything yeah. from your senses and everything else and not withdrawing so that's interesting that there's that two ways of going about it yeah i mean they're both have their place you know um they're both on certain extremes of each can be unhealthy you know uh if you're like you know when you talk about withdrawing from your senses that could be a a uh, sort of disassociation reflex, you know, something is overwhelming. Um, Cause you know, we're, we uh, thrive in connection with each other mm -hmm. in connection with ourselves. And, you know, um, you know, I know for myself, I used to be very cerebral in my headspace and thinking about a lot of things and, and uh, that gets you so far, you know, so I think the whole journey is about coming into your heart. And I say, I say in my comedy bit, I say, you know, it's the journey of self-awareness is from your head into your heart. And the journey is like an asshole. We all have one and mm -hmm. it's about letting that shit go, you know? So Well, it's very interesting that you said that because that's also something that was taught to me to uh, one of my, like my first teacher, he told me that the, the journey 
the object of spirituality is to journey from your mind into your heart. And that, and although if you measure the distance between your mind and your heart in inches, it's not very long, but that distance can take many years to traverse. So it's interesting right. that you would say that body, because because yeah. yeah. not everybody comes to that same conclusion that it is about getting into your heart. In fact, many Buddhists don't even regard that as even a thing, you know? Right. So, so yeah. what, brought, what brought you to that, what brought you to that conclusion that you want to get to your heart? Uh, what brought me to that conclusion? Yeah, the, to, to say that okay, the heart is is the place to be. I guess it's always just. A, I mean, it just feels nice, you know, when when you can be yourself, like vulnerable, and and uh it, you feel alive and connected um in a deep way um, interesting but but did and, you did you get that message like you said you did a vipassana retreat in california i don't know how yeah. vipassana differs from thailand and compared to california but were they talking about the heart for that retreat as well or is that something that you've found out about somewhere else I mean, um, 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 it's a whole, I mean, there's no like single experience, you know, but, um, but I mean, I feel like trauma, understanding trauma for myself, at least, has been very eye opening into the nature of my heart. And um, so when I was three years old, my parents divorced. And my mom, uh, so in Iran, uh, the mother after a divorce doesn't, uh, can't see the child. Um, and so she goes kind of on a mission to America to remarry and come back to get us. So for five years, since I was three until eight years old, um, you know, there was this feeling of abandonment and um, feeling unworthy of the affection or love, you know, for a baby. That's the message the baby receives. Right. Mm. And it's pre-verbal. It's before like the fancy language and cerebral thoughts that we get to have when we're older. And so, um, yeah. So, you know, uh, going through anxieties and depressions and all that sort over the years, I realized that, you know, my mental health problems is below the radar of language, right? It's in my body, like emotion and trauma trauma that exists in the body it, it gets stored there and uh, so the voices we use the way we move the body it, it's uh, animated from that space so um yeah so that's what i mean being attuned to the senses is to know yourself the nature of one's emotions the ins and outs the the source, the origin um, of the things that we feel, you know, and at the same time to not be defined by it, right? Letting it all, it's all in passing, right? It's all in passing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and of course, I don't want to put you on the spot. You, this is not uh, structured as just interviewing you. This is more like a casual conversation where you can also ask me questions and, you know, let it flow spontaneously. So if you if you want to ask me anything, you can too. Yeah, yeah. I noticed. So yeah, same question for you. What's uh, been the role of um, what does? Let me ask you about vulnerability. What does vulnerability mean to you? That's a very good question. You see, that's kind of a controversial question, actually, because from the one from one perspective. I recognize that an ideal for everyone is to be invulnerable, but I also recognize that there are two components to each individual. Namely, we have the mind and we also have the heart. Invulnerable to? Well, to be invulnerable, to have no weaknesses. The ideal is to come from a place of strength whereby your strength vastly exceeds your weaknesses that's the ideal to strive for in, in my opinion so the word vulnerable mm. i don't like the word vulnerable i do like the word empathy though right and i think that empathy can make us vulnerable in a sense because through empathy which is the gateway of the heart 
is how we can experience what other people are feeling. That it's actually possible to feel exactly what someone else is feeling through empathy of the heart. And, and in, in a sense, that's a bit of vulnerability because because it's no, it's not your feeling; it's somebody else's feeling that now you are becoming a part of, and 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 that is the vulnerability. However, in the mind, you can have the experience of the heart while your mind is invulnerable. And the only way that can happen is if your mind is in a continuous immersion with this ultimate Brahma and absolute bliss. So, if your mind is immersed in this bliss, your heart can be vulnerable via empathy and yet it's not going to disturb your mind and put your mind into a um a weakened place if that makes sense mm -hmm. so you're talking about the sort of the connection between the mind and the heart yeah to have both that you can have both you can both experience right. through empathy through the heart and be vulnerable there but at the same time right. you can have a strong mind right yeah, it sounds like uh, having like a softness of the heart that's receptive mm -hmm. and compassionate and also the hardness of the mind that's disciplined and focused. Yes, yes. And so, you know, many paths from my observation will focus on one or the other, but very few, in fact, I'm not even aware of which paths do both, except of course, I, the, the philosophy I'm representing is, is about both the mind and the heart. But um, in my opinion, the heart, the, the currency of the heart is love and the currency of the mind is truth. And the mind experiences that truth through inspiration. Inspiration. Mm. So what inspires you? Well, in, inspiration is a experience. And so where I'm coming from is my mind's always inspired. It always feels inspiration. And um, I know that kind of might alien, alienate my perspective from the average person out there who maybe is, does not feel inspired all the time. And that's fine. That's just my subjective experience. But this is what's brought me to the conclusion that truth is a tangible experience just as much as love is also a tangible experience. And the difference is, is that the experience of love is experienced through the heart, whereas the experience of truth is experienced via the mind and the, the, the crown. It sounds like um, you're giving some rationale to your experience of inspiration or truth? Yeah, well, in my opinion, it's more than rationale. It's more like you get these bursts of inspiration, these insights, these realizations, and I write them down and they just resonate. And it's not coming from the books I'm reading, but it's, it's like writing a book, you know? That's what I'm about anyway. Sure, sure. I mean, these things are kind of abstract, right? Um, we can spend all day just talking, you know, using these sure. words and, you know, running circles around linguistic associations and things like that. Um, but what's more interesting is the story, right? It's the human story. Um, so we all have a story. And uh, I think that's what's interesting is, is being able to... Um, you know, uh, one uh, definition of courage I really like is um, telling your whole story, something like that. It's about like, yeah, telling your whole story with your whole heart. Mm -hmm. Kind of like that. Um, yeah. And being vulnerable to your, with yourself. Um, I think it is good to be invulnerable to toxic stress for sure, right? Um, and that's a natural thing that happens when you're connected with your own self, your own truth. And uh, I mean, I, I, I speak that from the place of knowing 
my own journey with depression, for example, you know, it seemed unsurmountable and seemed unconquerable. It was getting worse and worse every year. In, in my younger to, days, I, I was totally diagnosed clinically depressed. It was, in fact, it got so low that I could, I was laying in bed once and I was convinced that I could kill myself with a single thought. And it was like, there's a question asked, well, you can kill yourself with a single thought now. Do you want to do that? And I'm like, no, no matter how bad it gets, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but, but yeah, then I went on antidepressants and all of that. And fortunately, I was able to get off of those eventually because those actually are quite addictive and have withdrawal symptoms. And they're, they're a whole other nightmare, actually, antidepressants. But go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. So yeah, to that point, what helped you, um, what helped you on the journey? Well, that's a good question. I mean, initially it was antidepressants that did artificially raise the serotonin levels of the mind. And, and there was a transition period where I was trying to get off them and I was doing a meditation. And at one point I, I, what would help me as well was this, there's this book called Huna, a beginner's guide by Enid Hoffman, which I talked about before, but the philosophy of the kahunas, their, their religion is very interesting because it's got some parallels with modern psychology. Are you familiar with it at all? No, I'm not. Well, basically what they teach is that you have a lower self, a middle self and a higher self, which is, which relate directly to your subconscious, your conscious and your superconscious. And they teach that the lower self is like the child within that takes everything literally. And that even whenever you're hard on yourself, whenever you say, oh, I'm stupid or I'm this, I'm that negatively, even if your conscious mind shrugs that off, that there's a part of you, the baby within that is literally taking in all of this stuff and um, dragging you down and how they teach to overcome this aspect is to name your lower self a secret name that only you know. And to tell your lower self that unless you hear this specific secret word, you're not talking to that child within. And, that, and so that way it forms a barrier between you know, the, the negative ups and downs of life with that child within. And at the same time, it gives you the opportunity to speak directly to that child within by using that secret name and to help to inspire it and say, Oh, I, I love you. And you're amazing. And you know, you're, you're, you are building it up over time. And just to share a little story, I was practicing this for about a month when I was in my early twenties and I was working at the time for a telemarketing outfit in California. And I showed up to work after practicing the Huna for about a month. And I noticed that there was a woman that was, in tears, a coworker, and she was crying and she was clutching her foot. And out of compassion, I just reached out and touched her. And then she looked at me and said, my pain just vanished. And so that was my first indication that there's more to life than science recognizes. I mean, yeah, that sounds like a, yeah, it, literally a touching experience, right? It was touching for her, moving for her. Uh, but yeah, that's connection, right? That's healing. That's um, yeah, and, and, and so, yeah. And so through the Huna, I started to feel for the first time this glowing sensation in my heart that like something was there in my heart that I didn't know before. And again, this is back many years ago when I was like 20 or 21 or something. But, um, you know, the way society has, has conditioned us, you know, we lose touch with our hearts or even recognize that we even have a heart. <laughs> and, and many people have never even experienced love or have any idea what love actually is. So, so what is love? Sounds like uh, you have a sense for it. Well, I mean, to me, it's more than a sense. It's an experience. It's the experience of the heart. And when you are experiencing love, it's natural. It's just like the way it's, you, you know, it's like you can't imagine living life any other way. It's like 
to experience love all the time is is really what we're designed to do in my opinion i mean what is love it, it's the it's like feeling that fire in your heart it's feeling um this pleasant uh, pleasure and um yeah um it, it's hard to define love right i mean there's hmm. it's just the invisible glue i mean it's uh yeah, it's the experience. Um, I mean, I would say it's in all things, pretty much, and especially all living things. Like animals have love. I mean, you know, people love their dogs and cats. Why? Because dogs and cats love them, right? That it's like love is everywhere. Yeah, and uh, yeah, unconditional. I guess um, yeah. You know, a lot of parents say they love their kids, but how unconditional is it? Um, one thing I want to say is, um, you know, being from Iran. Uh, poetry and literature is a big part of the culture. And one thing that's been pretty crucial in my healing is uh, has been poetry, and especially uh, mystic poetry um, by Rumi and Hafez. And uh, there's a line from Rumi, he says, uh, love is the sea where the intellect drowns. I, I love Rumi. Yeah. And uh... I, as far as that specific quote, I would say that the, the mind can also drown in truth. So, in fact, I would say that the mind drowning in truth is even more profound than the mind drowning in love. Because actually, if you're experiencing love, you're descending below the mind. And it's difficult even to experience both love and intellect at the same time. So, at least it is for me. <laughs> It's like it's like you're you're I'm either focused on the heart and feeling love, but if I'm using my intellect, it's like I'm in my mind. But maybe Rumi had a had a different experience. That's great. That's what diversity is so wonderful. We each have our own unique perspectives, and it's not necessarily which perspective is more superior than the other, but which perspective is each individual finds most effective. And is there anything else? Well, I mean, just to add to that, besides Rumi, do you have any other inspirational authors or figures that you find mm. inspiring? Um, yeah, loads, loads, loads. Um, yeah, lots of people. Yeah. I mean, uh, what really intrigues me uh, about people is uh, the questions we ask, you know, because we live in a world that our questions create. They provide the framework. Right. And uh, I, I noticed a few times you said uh, there are things that science can't explain. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say more about that? What's uh, what's your meaning about it? Well, like, for example, in psychology or psychiatry, they're prescribing antidepressants, right? And so they think, okay, well, this pill, this will solve your problem of depression, right? But mostly when it comes to medical science, what they are doing usually, I mean, in fact, the field itself is called medicine, right? It's not called, you know, preventative medicine. It's called medicine, right? So it's the, the whole concept is they are diagnosing and fixing problems after they have happened, as opposed to trying to prevent them from happening in, in, in the first place. And so the same thing is true with psychiatry. So it's like they give you this magic pill and you say, okay, you take this magic pill, your depression is going to go away. And now you're going to be able to cope more with, with life. And, and, but what that's doing is it's kind of putting a bandaid on the problem without going into the, the root deep, cause, the root cause. And also too, I mean, many times when they're prescribing things like antidepressants, what are they doing? They're, you know, they're doing something that maybe even putting somebody on an exercise regimen is going to fix, you know, with, with less side right, effects. The business, the business and the protecting a self-interest. And that's, that's a portion of the medical industry, maybe a large portion, a sizable portion, but go on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, 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 that's one example. I mean, keep in mind that in Western society, everything, I mean, profit is a big motivator to everything pretty much that, that goes on. Um, and when it comes to science, when it comes to me medicine, when it comes to politics, you know, it's all about making money. Um, and, and there are exceptions, money of course. Bad. 
Well, I mean, it's not bad, but when you put money as a higher priority than the mm. well-being of people, then it becomes right. bad. Then it becomes bad. And so, um, so, so I give that example because science can raise the, the, the serotonin levels in your, in your mind. But what science can't do is they've not been able to isolate what love is. Right? They can't give you a magic pill and say, okay, take this and now you have love in your life. They, they can't because they don't even know what love is. They can't quantify it. They can't isolate it and they can't replicate it. And so there's nothing in science that can prove that love even exists. And, and what they will do is they, they might say, okay, it's a chemical experience in your mind. Okay, well, if that's true, then why can't they create a drug that cre recreates that chemical experience in their mind? They'll, they'll argue I mean, that- You can say that about anything though, no? I mean, I can taste honey and I can write books about it for you, about what honey feels like and tastes like and everything about it, but you won't know until you actually try the honey for yourself, right? Well, that's true. But however, there are some manufacturers that have been able to make fake honey, which living in China, there is fake honey apparently, but they can't do that with love. And so the same thing is true with um, many, many other things, but you're right, many other things. So you've got the natural and you have the artificial. And of course, the difference between the natural and the artificial is the artificial is what's man-made and the natural yeah, so, is- so the, so the point about science, uh, I just want to be clear about something that mm -hmm. uh, um, science is a form of inquiry, right? Yeah. I mean, we all use some, some tools or aspects of science to improve our life quality every day. Like, you know, when you're working on your- um, your cup of uh, milk tea with honey, right? You're working on a certain concoction, there's ratios at play and you're trying to appeal it to your own taste and the moment and, right? Yes. Right, and then the outcome, right? And it's a work in progress. And, and I think, um, I think, I feel like maybe there's some people, I think what I'm hearing from you as well is like, this blanket judgment about science. And I, I, I'm, I, I think like that's fair because like, you know, it's been a lot of, <laughs> of closed-minded people that have sort of uh, been in places of power driving science. Well, well I mean, um, not, not to misunderstand what I'm saying because keep in mind, I do love science. You know, I, I respect science. I think we all should consider ourselves scientists of our own consciousness. And, right. and to have that level of scientific inquiry that we have a hypothesis right. and to, to prove that hypothesis by doing X and seeing what the result is with Y. And we can experiment on ourselves. We can do meditation. We can see how that affects our life. We can choose not to do meditation and do something else and see how that affects, affects our lives. So it, it's like we all are scientists in our own way. And the whole concept of having a hypothesis and proving the hypothesis through experimentation, I mean, that doesn't it doesn't really get more noble than that, in my opinion. However, yeah. um, when you start making assumptions and saying, oh, well, God doesn't exist. There's no proof that God exists. So it doesn't exist. Whereas that, because, some, because you can't prove something, that doesn't mean it just doesn't exist. So the true scientific perspective would be, okay, everything has the potential for existing unless we can prove that it doesn't exist. That, that to me is more of an open, open mind. Whereas science usually takes the opposite perspective and says that nothing exists unless we can prove it exists. You know, when it comes to God and things like that and love and truth, uh, these are important topics, right? And they're things that we get to perceive directly for ourselves. And there's no need for other people to agree or disagree. Like, like um like yeah there's no i don't know there, i don't see any need for that it seems like a like a need for religion because religion needs people to agree on certain premises about god and stories and things like that and you know um i just don't see a need for it so i think certain yeah certain uh and it goes without saying right like you feel all the cells in your body 
being nurtured by every breath and by the food and your life quality every day, like, and, and the feeling you're generating and, and cascading across the human network, um, you know, you feel that and it goes without saying, it's not a, it, like you embody it, you live it. And uh, like, it, that's it. It's like, um, you, don't, you don't, don't need to, you know, yeah, there's limits to philosophy is not, it is, has its limits, right? Like anything else. Well, I prefer to look at things as not having limits. And then whenever we see that there's limits, then we are starting to limit ourselves. Well, this podcast has a limit, right? I mean, time is is relative. Just because time is has is limited, does it mean? And it's not bad. Is rel- There's relative and there's absolute, and how you embody both in the moment. Neither is bad or good. It's just it is what it is, right? I just regard us as being timeless beings. And this podcast may end, but it doesn't define who we are, right? And nothing external defines who we are, that we are more than everything else, that, that there's more than, than you, you are more than you think you are. You are more awesome than you can even experience or believe. And the same I don't, I don't disagree. And I, yeah, same, same to you, man. Yeah. Yeah, and so so that's what I talk about when I talk about no limitations. I'm not talking about okay, yes, I'm drinking a cup of tea, and eventually this cup is going to be empty. So this tea is limiting because it will be empty soon. It's like no, it's like yeah, but we can always you know have more tea later. And even even so, it's like the concept of archetypes. For example, I'm sure you're familiar with Socrates and Plato's theory of forms, but the whole idea is that. There's something more awesome than anything you can experience through your senses. And there's nothing that truly dies because the best of everything is it continues forever. But that's a whole other conversation. Don't want to, I don't want to explode your mind. There's no mind. But how can you be mindful if there's no mind? Mindfulness is just a term, right? You just, uh, it's about being empty, surrendering your story and being in the moment. So you're open to receive through your senses and, and beyond. Well, you just talked about the journey from the mind to the heart. So how can you journey, make that journey if there's no mind? So there are definitions, right? Just the mind is a collection of impressions, right? And so mindfulness is the present, focused, non-judgmental awareness. And, and it's always now, yeah. And time, the dimension of time gives it a sense of a journey. And so that's also valid. It's an adventure. It's a dance with the unknown. Mm. And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've just to interject something. I mean, I, I would ne- personally, I would never say that there's no mind just because, and, and, and I respect your opinion, and, and I'm not trying to say anybody's wrong or, or, or not wrong, but in, in my experience, the mind exists as a, as a tool, a vehicle, and people can label it as, as ego or, you know, and you want, don't want to have a big ego. But I would say the co- people's concept of ego is simply a limited mind, a mind limited by self-limiting beliefs. And if you remove those self-limiting beliefs, then your mind is liberated and you become liberated. And then the mind, we're always more than the mind. The mind doesn't define us. But, to, but to say that there's no... My law is changing. It's a changing <laughs> dynamic, right? There's no... Um, yeah. Uh, so I wonder, what is the question uh, that you're asking yourself? Uh, like, what is the, what is, what, what intrigues you? You know, like all these things. Uh, what is, uh, what is the question? That's 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 beautiful to ask for you. But the question is a paradox. 
because once you cross the threshold of elimination, you no longer have questions. You only have answers. And it's like you become your deeper identity. It's like you become a, a cosmic personality as opposed to your former self. It's like each of us is in is deep undercover. And the problem is, is that everybody has identified with their cover identity, their superficial identity, without, without recognizing th th their deeper identity and not discovering that yet. And so we all keep these secrets from ourselves and, and we identify, uh, identify Who with- Who is we? Who is we? Everybody. It's like when you're born into this body, it's like you are born into people's conceptions of how you should be, who you should be, how you should act. And you have the differences, you know, and, and, and it's a lot body. of people. I wouldn't say everybody, but um, OK. All right. So you're not into questions. I get it. OK. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean if, if there is a, 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 the deeper questions of life would be like, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? That's, that's it, one question. It's often a boring question. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, you know, you're using language, right? Language is a form of framing your experiences. And language does shape the way we experience things, the way well, we tell well, how stories. How can you ask a question without language? Well, I'm saying it's valid. We use it, right? So, so we use questions to to direct our energy and focus and um, anyway. So, so yeah, it's uh, I think the beautiful questions form a beautiful mind. And um, yeah, so I guess uh, I'll just share this before uh, we close out here, which is um, quality of life is measured by quality of conversations and listening is vital. And uh, it's been beautiful to chat with you, man. I hope, um, I hope nothing, you know, just enjoy, keep enjoying yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, well, well, likewise. And the great thing about, about that is, is the more we make other people happy, the more happy we make ourselves. Do you find that right. to be true? Of course. Yeah. It overflows. Yeah. Yeah. But it's great uh, having you on Arya. And uh, I hope you didn't feel blindsided by the topic of conversation. You know, I find all of this fascinating and I find what you're about fascinating with mindfulness and you are awesome. Everybody's awesome and I want everybody to, to be the ultimate version of themselves. I think that's a good motive to have, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. There's always more to discover and uh, realize, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Great. So it's great having you on any, any final questions or thoughts before we close it down. Um, I guess the question I would ask the listeners is, um, yeah, what is the beautiful question that you're asking yourself recently? You know? Um, yeah. Cause we live in a world that our questions create. So um, to shape the world, ask better questions. Okay. Interesting. Well, thank you for that. You have a fantastic afternoon and in Chengdu. Cheers, man. Take All care. right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.